Hello, I'm author Paul Rushworth Brown, and welcome to Book Fair Australia in Sydney, Australia. Today I'm here with Karen Martin, the wonderful Karen Martin, who's written a wonderful book called The Bringer of Happiness. Karen, welcome to Book Thank Fair you, Australia. Paul. Thank you. Tell us about your book. Well, The Bringer of Happiness is a story uh, narrated by Sarah, and Sarah is the daughter of Mary Magdalene. So it talks about her story um, in that she time travels, and she time travels into a young Cathar girl. And the Cathars, um, they lived in Montague in the 13th century and they followed Mary Magdalene's teachings and the French king and the um, Roman Christian soldiers, they wanted to obliterate the Cathars. They sort of saw them as her 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 heresy. Heretics. 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 It's one of those words you can't get out, I can't get out. So she believes it's her destiny to save this young girl, to save her mother's teachings. Okay, wonderful. Um, now, there's been a number of authors that have actually uh, written novels with a little bit of uh, uh, historical, um, religious, with, with, with historical religious tone. When you decided to write this novel, did any alarm bells go off? Uh, yeah, for you? look, it, it's, it's really um, disconcerting wanting to write about a historical or especially a religious figure. So I took the, the historical. I, I, I thoroughly researched all the academics, the non fiction, and the fiction to ensure that anything I was bringing to the page sort of had a, resonant, a, a resonance but also could be supported by other information out there. So it's not anti religion and it's not pro religion. It's a story of a young girl who believes in destiny and she just happens to be the daughter of Mary Magdalene. So there's a lot of historical facts about Jerusalem at the time as well. Okay, wonderful. Um, I, as soon as you say the word time travel, um, I'm, that's something I'm absolutely fascinated with. Um, so yeah, it sounds intriguing. Um, so your first novel? No, this is the second. Second? Okay. Yeah. The first novel is a novel called Dance in the Labyrinth. And I wrote that when I was in Crete. I lived in Crete for a year. When I came back home, I couldn't settle. It was just really difficult. And I didn't want to live in Crete. I love it, but I didn't want to live there. So I wasn't quite sure what I needed to do. And I just received a redundancy. So I packed up my bags and I went on this tour to the south of France. And that's where I discovered the folklore about Mary Magdalene living in France. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, so that was the impetus for this story. Okay, so two novels are under your belt. Um, what do you think uh, literary success is for you? <laughs> well, the Booker or the Pulitzer? Well, take your pick, yeah, Nobel, yeah. fine. <laughs> um, I think it varies. My, my, my background is in theatre, and I always created work that strove for transformation, that it would plant seeds for people to, to have a think and to challenge ideas um, gently so people came to their own understanding. And I think in the books that I do, I, I just do the same thing. You just plant seeds and people bring their own stories to it. And if that helps them to transform and, and grow or move into you know, kindness or whatever, then so be it. I think that's, that, that, that's a good little skill to have. I suppose uh, coming from the theatre, that's a good background for sort of like a novelist, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, because then you understand the rhythms and the structure yeah. And, yeah, and the pace of it, yes. And tell me, um, do you ever read your book reviews? Yeah. 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 I mean, everybody gets good ones and bad ones. How do you deal with them? What's a bad one? A bad one. Oh, <laughs> you're lucky. <laughs> no, um, I, I have this, um, what I write, and, and to be honest, I write for myself. I write to try and understand and make sense of the world. And I did that in theatre, and I'm doing that in novels. And then when you put it out there, and you can see it and, and make sense of it, then it's open there for other people to also see it and make sense, or read it, and make sense of their world. So what they bring to it is their own story, and that, that has nothing to do with me. So I'm happy to put it out there, plant the seeds, and then I'm happy for people to say, yeah, that really worked. Or, no, it didn't work for me. But what that tells me is more about them than my book. And that's, that's what I think.
quite a scene. Well, um, I think, yeah. the hardest scene was the scene where um, Sarah's gone through a, um, a vision and she comes back and she's sitting with Mary and she asks Mary what, what this will mean and she's very distressed because the men in her vision have called her mother a whore and my editor had said, Karen, Schultz, don't tell us. I was like, oh damn, okay. Because um, I wanted to show how language worked and the power of language and, and who owned the language, the people who owned the power. And so I left it for a long time. It's the last thing I wrote. And it just became the most powerful. I put Sarah into the vision and it starts off with the elder just going, men, and pulling together these men who were compiling the New Testament. And it's, um, I, it's one of my favourite scenes now. It's very... It's raw, it's a very raw scene. And I don't need to go and, and go into the great you know, um, description about how the word whore has been changed and what it means and whatever. I do a little bit, but no. So it, it's, I actually like it when you're challenged by something, you just let it sit for a bit mm -hmm. and then it comes back to you. The muses were very, very supportive during that period. Um, tell me, uh, that was a good segue into my next question, and that's uh, how do you write a male character? Um, to be honest, Paul, my male characters tend to be a bit secondary. <laughs> the, I always have a very strong, um, well, always, I've got two novels. My, my protagonist is female and they get support from females. I believe that our history is very, um, it's got the male gaze there. It's a male history and women's stories aren't really shared or brought to the public realm. So I've, I've entitled the series Women Unveiled. Um, so that our stories are told. So the males are part of it, absolutely, but I'm more interested in the feminine journey. Okay, wonderful. Well, um, you mentioned before about power. When was the first time you, did you realise that uh, your words actually had some sort of power? That's a good question. That's a good question because words are very, very powerful. Um, what is it? The sword is mightier. No, the, the pen is mightier than the sword. Yeah. Who owns the language has the power. And we found that we've seen that um, with all, with well, with colonisation. What do you do when you're taking over a community? Get rid of the language. Um, so, for me, it was about identifying words that had been either misused or corrupted. So we look at the word virgin, for example. Um, Nor Hall wrote a book called The Moon and the Virgin, and she talked about the word virgin actually meaning a woman standing in her power, a woman owned by no one and look how it's changed now. So when we talk about Artemis, you know, that, the virgin huntress, it wasn't that she never participated in, in sex at all, it was just simply that she was a woman on her own, a woman in her power. So words have that power and I think what we're trying to do now is reclaim it. When you look at um, the, the pronouns, he, she, they, there, they're claiming that and I think that's a good thing. We use the word chairman for years and that was supposed to be universal. Well, it's not universal. It actually doesn't include women. So having chairperson or chair, it's it's more um, equitable. Yeah. Now, historical figures. Yep. When you start writing about uh, Mary Magdalene and uh, other obviously well-known historical figures, what type of ethics comes into it? Uh, I, learned, I learned this in one of the plays I did, the Women's Jail Project, where um, I had to do a lot of research because there was nothing in the public realm about these women who had been incarcerated in, a, in an asylum. And I didn't want the onus, um, because it was the first time out in the public sphere, I didn't want the onus of going, this is the history. I, I don't know, I don't claim that at all. I think there are many, many truths. And I think that by presenting another perspective is, is actually um, being a more inclusive truth, whether it challenges that one truth, uh, which it, this does. I mean, this, this book talks about Jesus surviving the cross. Whoa, that's a big one. Yeah. But there's enough, the Nag Hammadi, the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, there's enough um, academic research into that, exploring that, pulling that apart, as well as archaeological that um, suggests that that's not necessarily true, even though we've held on to it. So I think it's really important to go, this is fiction. I'm using historical truths, and I think it's really important for women to know where we've come from. So I try to be as 
factual as I can, but ultimately it's just a work of fiction. Karen Martin, the author, the author of The Bringer of Happiness, thank you very much for being, being with us. Thanks. And welcome to Book Fair Australia and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thanks, Paul. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks, Karen.